How you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Finally got some rain here in North Carolina. It's finally cooled off a little bit. Past few days, it's been reaching mid-90s with heat indexes of Satan's asshole. But now we finally got some rain. We got some cool off. Feels pretty nice outside. Hi, by the way, I'm Doug Lackey. This is WrestleView Weekly. I am veteran columnist for WrestleView.com and co-host of WrestleView Live alongside editor-in-chief of WrestleView.com, Adam Martin, when we cover all of the WWE pay-per-views. <clears throat> Today, going to cover, of course, Raw and SmackDown. We're going to review Raw and SmackDown from earlier this week, which was surprisingly entertaining. Yeah, shock. Both shows incredibly entertaining, and they both center around two letters R and E. Uh, being first on Raw, we have we finally got our return, and when I mean return, I mean a return on investment. But then on SmackDown, we got reunited, and I think you all know what that means. Uh, if you've read the spoilers, if you watch the show, you read the spoilers, read everything, the results about it, you know what I'm talking about there. But two. Incredibly interesting shows this week. Um, hopefully galvanize some interest or whatnot coming up to Money in the Bank paper. Uh, not Money in the Bank, I'm sorry. Extreme Rules. Uh, coming up in a couple of weeks here, I believe. Two or th Yeah, two weeks, I believe. Yeah, in a couple of weeks. Um, also going to recap the news. Lots of stuff on the injury front to talk about, including injuries to major um, NXT performer, major WWE performer, also some people coming back from hiatus, um, but another big one too is going to talk about the milk carton. We have got some updates to the WWE milk carton. Who's been missing for at least three weeks on major WWE programming? Where are they? But also we, some people have emerged and been found. So good for them. We know that they are alive and well. Yes. Also, I would like to go over some things when it comes to WWE television rights. Um, I only looked at it this morning. Um, I have had the stock ticker for WWE stocks um, up on my computer all day, but I've had the window minimized. I haven't looked at how much it is right now, but I know that it opened today at nearly $73. Highest ever that it's gotten to. Um, we're going to take a look at that and also the TV deals that warranted this incredible increase in value in WWE stock and why myself and everyone here at WrestleView are kicking ourselves because we should have purchased stock when they just became pri when they became private. But going to be looking at that. Also, a very very interesting match of the night this week. Um, it involves. Of course, it's going to involve two performers, but for number one, it is the first women's wrestling match that we're going to, we're going to be watching on this show. It's the very first one I've put on. Um, it involves Kana, also known as Asuka, um, in her retirement show in Japan. This is back in 2014, facing Mako Satomura. And Mako Satomura, I bring up in this because she is apparently going to be one of the participants in the next May Young Classic, the big women's tournament that the WWE is doing on their network later on this year. But she is going to be another one of the performers on the show. And so I didn't know what a Mako was, but I knew what Asuka was. And so did some investigating, typing in Mako, saw tomorrow, see what came up. And this match came up. And it is going to be a very, very interesting match because it is in... First off, it is in Asuka's retirement show. So it's called Kana Pro Mania is what it is. But also, it is different lighting and also music being played in the background. Kind of like how if you used to watch um, back when ESPN2 first came out in the mid-90s um, and they were supposed to show just extreme sports and poker and, yes, occasionally Magic the Gathering tournaments, they showed sumo wrestling and Muay Thai kickboxing. And in Muay Thai kickboxing from Thailand, Bangkok, Thailand, there would be a band playing in the background as to establish a rhythm for the fighters, which is really, really cool to watch. And I get that that's kind of what 
that was kind of inspiration for this match because we'll just we'll just check it out when it comes up. But I'm really really curious about this match having you know Sin Cara mood lighting and a dude playing an instrument in the background and this being Kana's or Asuka's final match in Japan. So I'm really, really curious about this one. So without further ado, take a sip of drink. This is uh, Captain Morgan's Silver Spiced Rum and Coke. Mm. And I'm also kind of scared about the pay-per-view that's going to be coming up with Extreme Rules because I almost have no clue right now what my predictions are going to be. So I've got to make sure i got plenty of tequila on hand to sacrifice to the gods which we'll is put it that way also a few other things before we start the show i keep on forgetting about this number one starcast coming up on labor day weekend over in chicago or schaumburg over the hyatt regency in schaumburg myself and adam martin will be part of podcasters row where we're going to be interviewing some people stop on by say hello get some cheetos from us get a nice snack we're nice like that uh, if you have any ideas for match of the night for my for the show for WrestleView Weekly up there, at Doug WrestleView is the handle on the Twitter. Send me a direct message if you've got an idea. Send me a link to the match. Describe the match. Let me know what it is. I cannot watch WWE stuff or anything that's on a subscription-based service. Okay, I'm not a pirate. I got both my eyeballs and I don't have wooden legs. Also above me, 52 followers to 100 before we check out all of Wrestle Kingdom 12. Wrestle Kingdom 13 is going to be coming up soon. And I would like to know what the hell happened at the last one before that one comes up. And I've heard a lot of changes have happened since this show. So either this is the show I'm hoping to watch or may have to change the show with all the changes that are happening on the New Japan front. But we'll see. We'll see. But until then, man, my hair is nice and fluffy today. On to the show. Yep, there we go. Kana versus Mako Satamura at Kana Pro Mania. Ah, so don't copy that, Republic. On to the Red Show. Monday Night Raw. Look at those two guys just loving each other and clutching each other's arms. That's Seth Rollins and uh, Dolph Ziggler. That's supposed to be Seth Rollins' uh, rematch for the Intercontinental title. That is the main event of the night. But first, we started off the show with, yes, in memory of Leon Vader White. It was a great two-minute uh, video package. Um, it was really cool to see the football photos, uh, football video of him in action. Um, but, yep, had to start had to start the uh, show with this. As always, with every Raw that begins, it starts with Kurt Angle and Constable Corbin. Your authority figures are in the ring. Kurt Angle brings up that Bork Laser and Paul Heyman are stirring the pot on the faces books and have backed out of this multi-man clusterfuck that they're planning over at Extreme Rules, which leads to Roman Reigns coming out saying WTF, which leads Bobby Lashley coming out saying WTF and saying F you to Roman. Roman says F you to Lashley and then blah, 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 blah. But then after that, Revival comes out. They say that they've learned some lessons from last week and that this week is the time for them to take advantage because they learned their lessons and learned from their mistakes. And now it's time to take advantage of them. So we have a rematch from last week where it's going to be Bobby Lashley teaming up with Roman Reigns to beat, go against the Revival. Yeah, let's just go ahead and play this little gif. He's tired of seeing your face just like all these people are. That's uh, Bobby Lashley speaking in reference to Brock Lesnar and why he hasn't shown up since Greatest Royal Rumble. Um, that's kind of been that's kind of been what they've been going over. Lashley's beef is that for the past three years, Roman has tried to beat Brock, and Brock's beating him all the time. Roman's saying that he thinks he's the only one who can do it. He deserves it because he's the rightful champion, because he wanted the Greatest Royal Rumble, but he really didn't because his feet didn't touch the floor and the body touched the floor, and Brock Lesnar's body hit the floor first. <laughs> Don't care what anyone says. Don't care what anyone says. And Bobby Lashley also saying that it's his turn because he knows how to beat him. Sure. I, I... 
if what this turns out being is Lashley facing Lesnar at Extreme Rules at, at SummerSlam or somewhere and Reigns doing a run-in to take out Lashley and it's going to be a two- or three-month program, I'm fine with that. It sounds way better than anything Lashley Zayn, where we'll talk about Zayn here later on concerning injuries. But the Revival came out trying to do their little rematch, and they won. They sure did. They rolled up, rolled them up, rolled up reins. Rolled up reins with a handful of tights. Yep, Dawson took the spear. Wilder comes up. Nope. Nah. That's how, that's how the bad guys do it. That's how the bad guys do it. So, what does that do with the revival? Well, you, you understand that they're there. That could be that they're going to be moved up a little bit in the tag teams. I mean, they're on TV. That's a great plus, right? But there are some tag teams who have not been on TV. Milk Carton will be coming up later to remind you of that. All right, and here we go with Hardy, Hardy and Wyatt doing their little entrance thing. They come to the ring, and then while they're waiting in the ring, uh, the B-team comes on the TVs. They start imitating them, which is really good and funny which will lead to a singles match between Woken Matt Hardy and Curtis Axel. Bell rings. Hardy quickly slammed Axel off the turnbuckles a few times. Axel blocks a kick and some punches. Hardy reverses a whip to the corner, puts him on the top rope. Hardy goes for a superplex. Axel blocks it. Axel and Hardy fall off the ropes. Axel lands on top of them. Axel picks up the fluke win. That's how you do it. That is how you do it. You can't have... Hardy or Wyatt just picking these two off clean. It's not going to build up interest. Fluke wins of what ha is what has built Axel and Dallas since the um, since the split of the Miz, the SmackDown. It, it's great. These fluke wins are great. Big team, B team celebrating and whatnot. And as they're walking away, Hardy does all that was wonderful. Clap, 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 clap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still photos backstage of the Banks and Bailey breakup. Kurt's seen talking to the Banks, and Banks ain't happy. Then we go to commercial. Elsewhere backstage, the Authors of Pain are walking backstage. What? Authors of Pain are back? Where the hell have they been? Well, I know they've been on the main event. They've been on. I know where they've been. Okay. Walking backstage, they shoved a stagehand. Titus Worldwide walks up to them. Tells them they need to show respect to the stagehands. They say thanks for your, the advice, but no thanks. Which leads to a squash match between. It's going to be between Authors of Pain and a squash match. Thank God they're off the carton. Thank God. And also, before we had that match, Bailey was backstage welcoming Alicia Fox back. Alicia Fox is back from her broken tailbone. She's back in um, on TV. So cool for her. Um, Looks like they've kind of just uh, gotten rid of the crazy gimmick that she had, which is all well and good. She hasn't been on TV for a while, so it's good for a nice, you know, not a repackage, but a nice little reset button play pressed on her. It'd be really interesting to see what she'll be doing on the roster. But Kurt Angle walks up to Bailey and says that she, Bailey's going to be teaming with Sasha Banks again, but this time it's going to be in a uh, six women tag against the Riot Squad with their extra partner being Ember Moon. We've already we've already seen this chapter, but I guess we're gonna read it again. Oh, it's a good one. It's a good one. But authors of pain get their squash match. Ouch. <laughs> I love me some AOP. I love me AOP. I love these brutes. They started beating the crap. Uh, well, actually, last chapter, bam. Um. They start beating the crap out of the uh, jobber team, and then out comes Titus Worldwide to make the save. AOP has had matches with Titus Worldwide on WWE main event, I think once or twice, since they have not been on mainstream WWE television. So they've been test driving this for a while. Um, I think that's the reason why AOP has not been on TV. It's just they, after their last squash match, back in April, and just how they were not conducting themselves but coming across on TV, there seemed to be some kinks to be worked out. So, looks like everything's okay. 
Looks like they're going to be back on TV. Looks like they're going to destroy some Titus Worldwide for a couple of weeks. I'm completely fine with that. No problem with that at all. Kurt Angle talking to Constable Corbin about the tag teams imploding, like Lashley and Reigns, like Banks and Bailey. AOP needs to keep their mouths shut in the promo department. Well, Andrew, as long as they keep writing them lines to do, there's nothing they can do about that. That's not their call. That's creative and writing's call to do. It's not their call. You give them lines, that's what they gotta <laughs> that's what they gotta do. Or else you just have them on TV, and when they're given an interview, if they are given lines, they just don't say lines and walk away, and that could be in subordination, and then we get a whole, oh no, they're in the doghouse again. So right now, they just have to do the best that they can do with what they're given, is what they can do. Uh, once again, Kurt Angle talking about all the really bad teams. Finn Balor walks in, wants to know why Lesnar had the multi-man man catch match canceled. Balor says he wanted a crack at the match. Corbin says Balor would have would have come up short just like he did last week. Balor asks if the manager of TGI Fridays knew Corbin stole his uniform. <laughs> mm. Strowman walks up to them, says he feels kind of bad for destroying Kevin Owens recently after he tried to be his friend. Aww. Strowman says he wants to be Owens' partner, and Angle's ask, Angle asks what his opponents would be. Strowman said Corbin and Balor. So we got another tag match of Corbin and Balor. Versus Owens and Strowman. I can't wait to talk about that one. That was such... Oh, okay. Can't wait to talk about it. Alexa Bliss is in the ring. and She's alongside Mickey James and talking about the Ronda Rousey attack. and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, remember. Yeah, I guess I'll play this. Yeah, it was. It was 100%. Like it was a great heat from the segment, though. Yeah. Loudly booed whenever she started talking about Rousey. I mean, that's a good thing, I guess. It's sometimes Bliss promos get a little brutal to listen to. And I don't know if it's because of her delivery. I don't know if it's because of the same old shtick of, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, and then turning on a dime. It's getting pretty old. So, yeah, I don't know. Promos from Alexa Bliss are kind of iffy with me. But Natalia came out, and she started harping, and Alexa says that they have a match, but she didn't come alone. Nia Jax is going to be at her ringside. And so we have Alexa Bliss versus Natalia. The winner by submission, clean, is Natalia. No interference. No, none of that. It was clean. Um... Yeah, that's what chicken shit heels get. They tap out. Especially to Natalia? Sure, why not? Um, I kind of figured that this is what you're going to be doing when Rousey is not on TV. You're going to have Natalia being her spokesperson, reminding people who Rousey is and that she's going to basically fight in her name. And there you go. And Nia Jax is just going to smile. You know, that uh, I feel sorry for Nia Jax right now is on the back burner. She's on the back burner. Going to take a little rest from being on TV with that character, which I love. I do admire the anti-bullying campaign that Nia Jax had and everything, but it it wore out its welcome. It served its purpose. I think she needs to get back to just being monster, destroy pretty girls. You know, kind of be what karma was. You know, what we dreamed of karma being. Or Awesome Kong, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but it's a dream of mine. If that's what they do, that's what they do. If they don't do it, that's fine. That's fine. But right now, this is what we're getting, is Natalia to take the place of Rousey and be her spokesperson and fighting in her name. Is what we're going to be having. Logic states that either Natalia should now be added to the title match because she beat the Raw Women's Champ by submission. Natalia is good in the ring, but it's stunning that after wrestling for so long, she has no idea how to emote or act. Yeah. Pretty much. On a promo, she's okay. The promo that she did um, butting into Bliss was fine, but in the ring, she is cardboard. She is incredible cardboard. I mean, no emotion, no 
acting, no facial expressions, no nothing. It's just a robot is what she is. She's a robot. All right, Charlie's backstage talking with Seth Rollins about the rematch. Ziggler, he's going to beat him, and he's got a plan for Drew McIntyre, and blah, 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 blah. Backstage, Jinder Mahal and Sunil Sting are having their pictures taken. While the Riot Squad walks up, they take the camera that's being used. They took some shots themselves, and they threw it on the ground, but then Mahal calmed himself and did some namaste stuff. Ah, it's okay. Namaste, 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 namaste. And they, the three girls walk off confused. They're supposed to be angers. That's weird. But, all right. Six women tag match of the Riot Squad versus Sasha, Bailey, and Ember Moon. I could go ahead and go into descriptions about the match. The match itself was no different than any other six per women tag that we've seen. Other than... People getting distracted, wacky stuff going on on the outside. Uh, Sasha goes after one of them, getting up to the apron. Ru Ruby Wooby Wyatt rolls up Sasha for the win, but that's the thing. Sasha got rolled up from the win for the win. After that, Bailey gets in the ring and goes full on nuts. Yeah, that's our return on investment right there. That right there. Perfect. That right there was perfect. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, this is, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm so glad that this in particular happened. What I'm saying is it's about goddamn time we got a return on investment on this stupid program. This has been going on for nearly six months. Six or seven months. This is a program going on that lasted through WrestleMania, has had no resolution, no nothing. And we finally, we finally, finally get the return. All right. There was a chant going of we want tables during this beatdown. But the thing is, the beatdown and the beatdown itself was not anything out of the ordinary. She slung her face into the middle turnbuckle. She tossed her from out inside the ring to the outside of the ring. She slung her into the stairs. She didn't grab any chairs. She didn't get any tables. She didn't do anything else. However, and I wonder, no, we don't have it here. However, as Sasha got her beat down, Bailey got on top of her and started yelling, this is from three years, not from just the past week. You think you're better than me. You think you're better than me. You're nothing. You ain't shit. That was bleeped out. She actually said that. Ironically, that entire line that she said was verbatim the same thing that Sasha said to her during their epic match at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn, the first one. Don't believe me? Look it up. It was said during the match, where Sasha's got Bailey down in the corner, verbatim, the same thing. And there is just something about when a story like that comes full circle like that. It is magnificent to watch. It's magnificent to see played out, especially when it's done well. Okay, not when it's forced. Okay. What we saw from Bailey, right there, fabulous. Now, does this mean that Sasha is now the baby face in peril and getting the shit beat out of her? Absolutely not. This was not a swerve. This was not a Bailey swerving heel. No. On the contrary, this was Bailey magnifying how much of a face she is. And this was Sasha maybe becoming a light heel of some kind. Are we going to see Sasha get revenge and a come up and? Maybe. I'd like to see her try, but I would also like to see her, she'd try to, but then she'd back off. You know. I would like to see more of, I think when it comes to Sasha, yeah, she seems to be the boss and everything, but I'd love to see her in a chicken shit heel role than a badass heel role. I don't see badass heel coming with this. This was Bailey beating the crap out of a girl that had been backstabbing her for so long, but now is down on herself 
and has been down on herself because she thinks she's so good, but won't give Bailey the time of day. So Bailey's like, well, shit, I'll just beat the shit out of you. If you did Bailey heel, you'd have to change the music in the entrance. Yeah, you kind of have to do that. But also, I kind of like the idea, and we kind of floated it out there. If Bailey turned heel, you could make her an oblivious heel to where you didn't change anything, you didn't change it at all, but she would try. She would go up and try to hug people, and they wouldn't want to hug her, and she would be like, "Ah, oh, it's okay. You still love me. Yeah. Hugs everywhere. Yay, I love you. You know. An oblivious heel is a great heel, I think. But, again, I just want to get that play. God, it was so good. That was so good. On my DVR, I watched this about a good five or six times. Commentary did a fabulous job on it, too. Uh, the reactions from Coach and Cole and Graves were just fabulous. Were just great reactions. Even though with the actions that she was doing were not exactly the most magnificent or the most jaw-dropping, they made sure that they put as much emphasis as they could on it to make tell everyone that, you know, this is a big effing deal, okay? Dull match, hot post match, having Bailey attack her as soon as the bell rung was a good and unexpected move. Nice to see Bailey not acting like a total moron like they always book her, including how she was booked last week. It was a nice surprise. Well, yeah. Think about how bad the kendo stick match was last year. When it comes to the kendo stick on a pole match, and that, ironically, that happened the same time last year. And we could talk about how bad it was and how bad it made Bailey look. But you have to understand, that's not what the Bailey character uses. The Bailey character does not use kendo sticks or chairs or ladders or anything like that. She doesn't do any of that. Why would she? No, that's not her M.O. That's not in her, that's not in her pathos. That, no, 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 no. That doesn't make sense. So the reason they had that match was to show how brutal Bliss was in keeping the championship, not in downgrading the Bailey character. That was really just to show that the Bailey character could not go as far as Bliss to keep the title. But it takes a certain thing, a certain thing to turn the switch on, on the Bailey character, to make her get ruthless, to get aggressive. What does it take? It takes friendship and backstabbing and investment that you placed into someone and it backfires, and you don't get a return on that. That's what it takes to get this. Okay? It just doesn't come out like, okay, you're going to be a kendo stick on a pole match. Well, no, 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 no. No. This is what did it. It was, it's called character development. It's what it is. It's called character development. And it's a great job of character development. So many years for like the past year. For the past year, year and a half, we heard people decrying that Bailey should not have come to WWE main roster, that she was taking up space. They didn't have anything for her. They didn't know what to do with her. She was supposed to be the John Cena of the women's division. She was supposed to be this, supposed to be that, but she's not this. She's blah, 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 blah. Howdy there, Jamel. But <laughs> I loved all the arguments and complaints that people had about Bailey for the past year. Now they were saying that WWE had nothing for her. No, she's bad character. She's bad fit. She was supposed to be this, supposed to be that. This is what you get with investment in a program, an investment in a storyline. Not talking about just the stuff in the ring, okay? Not talking about the moves. Not talking about the counter moves. Not talking about putting on 15 minute to half hour long to one hour long Iron Man match, epic matches. That has nothing to do with this conversation. What this conversation is about when it comes to Bailey as a character actor is what happened here. This is what she's good at. Okay. This is the first time you cared about anything related to Bailey in almost a year? Well, yeah. Most is the case with everyone, including me. The one thing I was hating right now is that we were not getting a return 
on this damn program that's been going on for six to seven months, okay, of this passive, aggressive, you know, awkward friendship. And it finally, finally boiled over. And it was great. I doubt she can pull off being mean as shit. No, 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 no. This is not turning her heel. She's not going to be some badass heel. She's not going to be mean as shit. No, no, no. She's just going to be mean to this person. Okay. Um, but it's great. And it's a great payoff for the character. It's great buildup for the character. Do you not think that Bailey's probably going to get back in line to go after the women's title? Probably. Will Sasha be there to cut her off and have another program? You're damn right. You're damn right. This is now the Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn of the women's division. Best way to put it. This is the Owens Zayn of the women's division. And we finally have it now. We finally have it now. It's built up. We've got it. Now it's time to get the matches out of it. Now it's time to get the promos out of it. And now it's time to get that build to we finally get a resolution out of this. It took us seven months to get the return on investment. Lord knows how long it's going to be until we see a resolution to the investment when we get our full return from it. Am I going to make some predictions on that? God, absolutely not. I, I can't. All that I can tell you is um, there is a Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. That's what I would put my final conflict on. I would put those two in Hell in a Cell. No title involved. That makes it even better. But not having the title involved makes it great. Because you're solely concentrated on the vile hatred that these two would have on each other. That's my two cents. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. That's fine. That's fine. All I know is I'm just glad we finally got the return. Godforsaken, passive, passive program. Kurt Angle uh, still talking to John Cone. He needs to know about the Bailey Bank situation. I think you just saw it there, dude. Owens walks up to Angle, asks him, "Are you crazy? You haven't meeting up with Strowman?" And Angle says, "But, but, but you were trying to be his friend. I thought this would be great." No way, Jose is making his way to the ring with his people dancing. He's going to be going against Mojo Rawley again. Mojo Raleigh comes out to the ring, and he's embarrassed to be out here because of no way Jose's conga line. He comes up to someone with a cheeseburger costume, asks him who he is. He says he's Todd. Raleigh asks if this is how he plans on impressing his mother by dressing as a cheeseburger on national television. Raleigh says this moment is the closest he'll ever get to being a WWE superstar. This is the pinnacle of his entire existence. The crowd's chanting for Todd. <laughs> Raleigh says that Todd will never be a superstar, and he, to answer Jose's question on if he'll get a rematch against him, the answer is no. Jose approaches him, so Raleigh drops him with a right hand and walks away. No match. We got no match between the two. But there's nothing that I'm... I mean, that's great and everything, but it's kind of weird that Mojo has this kind of a program going on where he's berating people who are in a conga line when he himself hadn't been on TV in about a month. So I don't know who's to talk. <laughs> it's kind of an odd, odd situation to be put in, you know. But heels got to be heels. I, mean, I get that. And we're not supposed to have the attention span or the memorization to do that. You know, Bailey walks into Kurt Angle's office. Angle says he doesn't care about Raw or the women's revolution. Next week, Bailey is going to counseling. Angle says that she's going or she's fired. Now, this is what I want to talk about right here. So, everything that I spoke of earlier about Bailey and um, how we don't think she's turning heel, it's just going to be on Sasha, Dr. Shelby coming back, absolutely, hug it out. But, it's these segments here that they're going to be doing now with Bailey that could inevitably turn her full heel. They could. We're not sure. Or they just further confirm that she just hates Sasha Banks' guts. Um, but how long that's going to last? I don't know. 
just when they made the Bailey Sasha Banks storyline interesting, they're sending Bailey to counseling next week to ruin it. That segment will only work if they bring back Dr. Shelby. I hear you, Tedesco, but you can't shit on something if they haven't done it. You can't shit on something if it hasn't happened yet. You can't shit on something immediately. Okay? Especially while the show is still going on. There have been plenty of times where I've been on the Twitter or I've been on Facebook and I watch uh, the timeline roll by about people commenting about stuff that's happening on the show when there's still another hour and a half to go. (laughs) And then it just turns around and it actually turns out pretty good. Or it doesn't happen the way that they initially thought it was going to be, how it was going to be really, really bad. End up with egg in your face. It's why you kind of hold off on saying if something is horrible. Once something is finished, then you can say that it's horrible. You can't say that something's going to ruin something when it hasn't happened yet. You can't do that. You just can't. Braun Strowman's making his way to the ring. He's going to team up with Kevin Owens. Every time... <laughs> Every time he looks at me, he does this weird thing with his tongue like he wants to eat me. <laughs> Braun does have a thing with his tongue. I mean, I'll admit that. was wondering if they turned Bailey heel if you needed to have an evil doctor to plant seeds, just fantasy booking. Well, I hear you, Andrew. I hear you. Yeah, it is a fair amount of fantasy booking. I'm not going to fantasy book it either. It's either she's going to be full-blown heel or just hates Sasha's guts. It's going to be one of the two. By the way, uh, speaking of the tongue, So, Braun Strowman and Kevin Owens teaming together against Baron Corbin and Finn Balor. This was so fun. This was an incredibly, incredibly fun match. Because on one side, you've got the typical enemies teaming up, tagging each other in when they don't want to be tagged in. Animosity between the two of Corbin and Balor. But on the other side is a dynamic that we... I cannot remember the last time we saw this kind of dynamic where one partner of the team is incredibly afraid of his partner and what he could do to him. And through, But throughout the match, that was the story. That was the dynamic that Corbin and Balor, they just could not get along. But Strowman was trying to get along with Owens and Owens was just scared shitless of wanting to do it. Which led to moments of Strowman holding out his hand for Owens to tag in and Strowman yelling out, get in there! And Owens like, okay, I'm all right. (laughs) Or at times where, um, I don't know if they'll show it here. No, they don't have it here. Of where Owens is stomping away on Balor in the corner, or Corbin in the corner, I can't remember. No, it was Balor in the corner. And he was initially going, that's why I'm the man. But then he turns around and sees Strowman and just like, oh, no, no, never mind. (laughs) Strowman and Owens together, whether it be as a team or as a program against each other, just the interactions between the two are fantastic. Okay. Owens being the man, the guy won't shut up. He won't stop emoting. He's just fabulous on the ad lib. Fabulous on the promos. He's just fabulous on everything. Outside of the ring, inside the ring, just as good. Combining that with Strowman's just, the his own voice. Strowman's voice is so great. Just the voice alone. He projects it. Everyone hears it. God, it is forceful. It's intimidating, just like how he is. This combination is great. Okay. What will it mean? Who the hell knows? It's really freaking entertaining right now. Um, wouldn't be mad if they put them together as a reluctant team or have them go at it in extreme roles or something. Yeah, the book is wide open on these two. Whether you have them team up or you have them go against each other, it's wide open. Who knows what could happen? In my mind, I'm almost thinking that at one point they're teaming up and Owens steals Strowman's briefcase. And then the whole time you have got a cat and mouse game. We're seeing it initially right now where Owens is always trying to run away from Strowman. Strowman always seems to get the better of him. But what if 
<laughs> what if Owens does actually get the briefcase and he runs away? You know, that just kind of, that's just imagination. That's all. Just some creativity. That's all. But the stuff that they were doing in the ring of this match, <laughs> the best part of this match was, of course, Strowman doing the choo-choo and then telling Owens to do the same thing. Yeah, he goes, choo-choo, chugga 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 choo choo <laughs> But then he would get Owens to do the same thing, and he bowled over Balor, but then Corbin caught him with a clothesline. <laughs> uh, Braun and Owens get the win via countout, because Corbin and Balor are beating the crap out of each other up the ramp to cause the countout. This was an incredibly fun, fun match to watch. Just like, again, this whole show was incredibly entertaining. I'm very, very surprised how this show ended up. Um, later on, we got Owens. He, he tried to shake Braun's hand after the match, saying, this is what we can do, this is what we can do. But then Braun quickly changes to Grumpy Braun. And Owens got scared, grabs his bag. He tries to run away, tries to get to his car. But uh, apparently Braun... Uh, Flipped over Kevin Owens' car. So he's not going anywhere. Takes uh, two guys with fire extinguishers to, extinguishers to put out a fire of some kind. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's going to help. Great hustle out there, guys. Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> Great show. Great show so far. But then we get to the Intercontinental title rematch between Seth Rollins and Dolph Ziggler. Drew McIntyre is in tow. Um, this was counter after counter, finisher after finisher, kick out after kick out. Almost reminiscent of any Undertaker match at WrestleMania. Um, yeah, we got the dive out. Yeah, we had the dive out spot. We've got the zigzag on the apron spot. We've got the f superplex float over spot. It's starting. It's, it's really starting to become paint by numbers, but I get it. Yeah, that's what makes their matches so dynamic. I really just wish they would cut, cut back on the pinfalls, cut back on pinning. Okay, um, that's kind of why New Japan's matches, when I watch them and they have all the kick, the finishers. And then kickouts from them is because they don't have as many kickouts from the finisher. They'll do a big move, then follow it up with a big move, then try to pin them, and they kick out. Okay. I think there's way too many covers in these types of matches. They need to tone it back. Uh, but anyway, uh, Rollins uh, goes for a cover. After that float over, McIntyre came into the ring and pulled, he pulled the referee out, causes a DQ. Uh, McIntyre and Ziggler beating up on Rollins. Out comes Roman Reigns. Great, great camera work. Oh, God. Dolph has got the hair cell down to a T. Dear Lord. For the love of God. <laughs> oh, God, that's such good. Man, man, oh, man, oh, man. But in the end, oh, damn it, didn't mean to do that. But in the end, yep, Ziggles and McIntyre walking up. It was a very good match, don't get me wrong, but it just seemed pain by numbers. Kind of thought Dean would clean, show up instead of Roman. Nah, no, no, no. They're saving Dean for something else. They're going to save him for something bigger, something a little bigger. It was a very good episode of Raw. Very, very good episode with... 77% giving a thumbs up and 23% saying thumbs down. Wow. Wow. Who, what couldn't you like from this show? What, what didn't you like? Did something not happen that you thought would happen? Probably. That's probably why they voted bad. Because something didn't happen that they thought would happen. Because it didn't go under their writing. Brrr. On to the blue show. Who's that big tall guy hugging the small guy? That looks like a cane. That is a cane. What the hell is cane doing there? 
that small guy looks like, well, I know that ass anywhere with that printing on those tights. That's a Daniel Bryan. Oh, my God. It's team hell no. Yeah, pretty much. Start off the show with Miz TV with the Hammer Brothers in the ring. They don't say a goddamn thing because the Miz is doing all the talking for them, saying why they're angry with Daniel Bryan. Mayor Kane, yep. Dean's going to mess up either a Seth title shot against Lesnar or possibly lost the NXT title at SummerSlam. My betting right now is going to be that Seth Rollins is going to get to a title match against Lesnar at SummerSlam. I'm, I'm going to bank on that. I can absolutely bank on Ambrose coming back and turning on Rollins. Getting come up and spur all kinds of backstory shit that will be fabulous to play out with. Will be absolutely fabulous to play out with. And we can go ahead and go over how Rollins and Ambrose have done that song and dance before, but I wouldn't complain if it happens again. Especially, these are two completely different characters now. Rollins isn't the chicken shit heel anymore. Rollins isn't the up-and-comer trying to build up a name for himself, the wacky and insane guy. No, they would be two completely different characters. Where now Seth Rollins is the workhorse, that ain't a chicken shit anymore, and Dean Ambrose coming back just being pissed off. Just not taking anymore. Pulling a Bailey. That's what he would be doing. Anyway, back to the Blue Show. Hammer Brothers on Miz TV. The Miz basically painting the story of why the Hammer Brothers are angry at Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan stole their thunder when they won their match last week. That's fine. Daniel Bryan comes out, interrupts the Miz TV, and just asks uh, which he wants to fight. He's not going to fight all of them, so which one's he going to fight? Harper steps up to the plate, so we got Daniel Bryan versus Harper for the main event today. Backstage, we got the New Day speaking with someone who is um, putting pancakes in a blender? Making a pancake smoothie and Xavier drinks it? I I Oh, whatever. Eh, whatever. Xavier Woods versus Rusev. So the New Day comes out. Then Aiden English comes out and does his spiel for Rusev Day. This was a match to build up Rusev, okay? Because he's got the title match against AJ Styles over at Extreme Rules. Very, very good basic match. To tell the story of why Rusev is important to pay attention to in the match against AJ Styles for the title. How this is not a fluke. After the match gave a fabulous promo basically saying how you know this was about AJ Styles this match was not about pancakes or trombones or anything else this was about how AJ is afraid of me that's why he punched Aiden English he wouldn't punch me I'm gonna break into his house I'm gonna take his title and it's gonna be a great Rusev day perfect just perfect uh, I like what they're doing with Rusev. Solid win against Woods. He and Styles will have no doubt have a good match. I wonder if they, I wonder if they'll decide to put the title on him. Internet told me Rusev was being buried and unhappy with the spot. Yeah, isn't that weird? Wasn't it weird that we heard so many reports that Rusev was not happy about where he was in the WWE, and so they had to, they, they yeah, that he just was not happy. He was just so angry. And that even though he was getting merchandise and had a casket match with their most popular performer of all time in a country where they made a billion dollars. I don't get it. I don't get it. I absolutely love, I despise but love at the same time, internet rumors and stuff like that. That's why WrestleView, we don't do that crap. We don't talk about that crap because it's not warranted. There's no sources to verify it. Rusev sure is in the doghouse. He's got the highest selling merchandise. And he's got a title match coming up. I don't get it. I really don't get it. I love when I just I really love when rumors and shit start, and it's all based on just what they see on TV. Nothing else. Nothing else. Other than they just see that, you know, Rusev says something on the Twitter and WWE taking advantage of it and switching the match at the Greatest Royal Rumble. And then they put it right back and everyone starts wondering, 
sparks up interest in Rusev? Don't you love getting worked by the workers who know how to work? <laughs> All right. Jeff Hardy doing weird shit on his face going up against um, Eric Young for his uh, little U.S. Open challenge because it was initially supposed to be Jeff Hardy versus Shinsuke Nakamura for the U.S. title, but was said that uh, Nakamura was injured and he could not make the match. Um, story is from the WWE website is that a police dog bit him and that he could not make. We're not seeing any reports on that. It's all a work. It's kayfabe. Don't worry about it. This is a U.S. Open challenge. Going against Eric Young. That's what it is. Rusev knows how to troll people. Balor's pretty good. Balor's okay. Balor's okay at trolling people. In, in a Well, no. He's okay at trolling people. Rusev's great. Owens is fantastic. Um, but that's about it. Yeah. Jeff Hardy versus Eric Young. Open U.S. title challenge thing um this was all about just isn't it weird i mean look yeah it would be yeah police dog biting jeff sounds a lot more viable than biting shinsuke can we think about this for a second If I approached you seven years ago and told you that the match that you're watching right now on TNA Impact between Jeff Hardy, well, not seven years ago. I think it'd be more like five, four years ago. Yeah, four or five years ago. If four or five years ago I approached you and said that the match that you're watching right now on TNA Impact between Jeff Hardy and Eric Young will happen four or five years from now, inside a WWE ring. Would you believe me? Because this was surreal for me to watch. Incredibly surreal. To see these two who used to go against each other at Impact, and now they're here. Think about that. But what's weird about it, when you look back at it and you compare where they were and where they are now and what was going on then and what's going on now. Nothing has changed with Jeff Hardy. Nothing. They're trying, just like how they did with Awoken Matt Hardy, so now they're going to try to do with Jeff Hardy, but not really changing anything, just changing his appearance, just doing the, the wacky, weird face paint shit. But nothing changing in the ring. Sloppy is all hell. Lethargic is all hell. About as, fa about as mobile as a silo, though he's supposed to be quicker. Okay, he just, he does seriously move around like an addict. Okay. Meanwhile, Eric Young, for the first time that I can think of, well, I mean, think about the past characters that he's had at TNA. Angry Canadian, um, weird, happy, crazy guy. I guess is the best way to put it. But now he is given a legitimate character. He is a leader of a stable of maniacs. And he is supposed to be the sane maniac of them all. I mean, it's so weird how time does this, you know. Uh, by the way, it would be a no contest. The Usos ran uh, up to the ring while the match was going on. Dane and Wolf attack them, and then Eric joins the fray. It comes into the ring, causes a DQ no contest. This would lead to a six-man tag with the Usos and Jeff Hardy against Sanity. I really have had a soft spot for Eric Young. He, I would always question, like, the stuff that he would do in the ring, but he needed to emote in the ring. I had no problem with his character acting. His character acting away from uh, the ring. He's got a unique voice. This unique sandpaper in his throat voice that's way more sandpaper than Braun Strowman. But it sounds so gnarly is what he sounds like. You know, it sounds grizzled. But doesn't look the part. And so he has to try to do it in the ring. 
and in the ring, I was always kind of questioning because some of the moves that he would do were way too technical for what the character is supposed to be. And what I mean technical is convoluted. You know, your character is a maniac. Fight like a maniac. You don't do weird holds. You don't do counters. You don't do anything. You're just maniac. Beat the shit out of him. You know? Just like how, like, Alexander Wolf is great. I love his, I love his selling. I love his bumping. I love his mannerisms. He's great. Killian Dane is just a big old ball of fun. <laughs> like Derek including when he came down to Memphis with Team Canada. Yeah, yeah. Um, This whole Sanity versus the Usos thing with random person to throw in is going to be reminiscent of the New Day versus the Usos, but it's going to be more reminiscent of the Wyatt family versus the Usos, okay? And those matches, I loved. Oh, watch you some Harper and Roman as the Wyatt family versus the Usos. And this was before the character changes, before Hammer Brothers and, you know, gangsta rap Usos. These were fabulous. Okay. Um, yeah. So this was a little surreal to watch. Um, there was also a glow segment involving Naomi and Lana dancing stage which is kind of weird so i just put that on the back burner uh the good guys won the six-man tag that's all that matters it was really fun it was a fun match though they get the right person could be similar to the shield versus the wyatts man that is a lofty bar that is a lofty bar that match really sticks in my mind is shield versus the wyatt family i think it was elimination chamber 2016 or 2015 2015 or 2016. God, that was such a great match. Oh, that was a great match. And that was to lead into WrestleMania with the Shield going against um, Evolution. I think is what it was. Well, it led into a program post-WrestleMania of the Evolution versus Shield. But, God, that match. Oh. Wyatt Family versus Shield is fantastic. Oh, man. Becky Lynch versus Sonya Deville. The main purpose of this match was for you to understand that Becky Lynch is an important person. She is an important part of the women's division. Why? Because she's going against Sonya Deville. Um, yeah. So, they had a match. Uh, Mandy Rose came down in tow. That wasn't a factor. Uh, Becky wins via submission. Clean. Yeah. Becky Lynch may be on a streak, but she didn't win Money in the Bank. She's always been up the ladder for Money in the Bank and always get knocked off. You would think that they would try to build off of a character like that. You thought that they would build off of her where she turned into a badass. Where she just turned into, I just don't give a shit anymore. I'm going to beat the crap out of people. But you can't beat the crap out of Charlotte tonight because she's doing a photo shoot for ESPN. That's when you do it. When Charlotte returns, that's when you do it. Just armchair fantasy booking. It's what I'm good at. It's what I've always been good at. But I also have no problem with being wrong. That's what makes me a good fan. James Ellsworth, he's backstage, and uh, Ty Dillinger showed up to make fun of him. Um, Zelina Vega and Andrade did one of those weird little, you know, cell phone video thingies to remind you that they're there. Yeah. So that whole thing he was doing with Sin Cara, you know, just forget that. Forget that. You know, speaking of Sin Cara, we'll be talking about him soon. James Ellsworth music hits. I didn't realize he had music. Um, he comes out to the ring. He starts talking up. Carmella and talking down Asuka. The two of them are not there because they're too busy promoting in Asia. They didn't say that, but that's why they weren't there. Paige comes out and basically says that Carmella is going to face Asuka at Extreme Rules for the belt, but also that uh, next week James Ellsworth is going to be facing Asuka. So, yeah. So that sounds like fun. And then up comes your main event, Daniel Bryan versus Luke Harper. This was a very, very good, fun match until Rowan gets involved. Uh, they, the Hammer Brothers beat the shit out of Daniel Bryan. But then out came Kane to make a save. And we felt like that. 
Yeah. Weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting that at all. It was nice fun. It was a good fun show. Um, yep, Team Hell Now is back, which is always fun. Does that mean they're going to win? Probably not. Probably not. But it's just nice fun. I remember. You remember? I remember. I remember. Good, solid main event. Good, fun stuff. Don't know what the poll was. Don't care. Fuck you, it was fun. <laughs> they were very fun. Yeah, these were two really good shows. Returns on investment. Reuniting. You know? Great stuff. Little things here and there to complain about, but way outnumbered and way outshined by what was good. What was well done. What was produced well and performed well. Great, great shows all around. So, there you go. Man, it feels good to talk about. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the SmackDown poll still has that middle button, but I don't care. I don't care now. People can be in the middle about stuff. They need to make it. Now, I'm blaming Roy. It's Roy's fault. Everything's Roy's fault. Let's talk about some news. Well, look at that shiny little fella. Let's go back to that. Look at that shiny little fella. Why, that's Kota Ibushi. I know him because he wrestled a blow-up sex doll. Not because of anything else. It's because of blow-up sex doll. He's going to be over it all in. But the reason I have this up is because of that. Yeah. But also because um, all in itself on their Twitter feed, I don't know if that's Cody or who is saying it, they can confirm, according to their Twitter feed on the 20th, uh, last Wednesday, we can confirm that we have decided in favor of licensing production. So 100% of this event will be broadcasted in some capacity. We want as many people to see it as possible. Details in the coming weeks. So it's going to be broadcasted. Don't know how. I've got a feeling they're going to be doing it online through a streaming service and they'll do a uh, a fee of some kind to do it. It's not going to be pay-per-view. No way. Charlotte Flair was on the ESPN Body uh, magazine cover. Uh, yes, she did have some boob work done. Some repair work because she had the photo shoot coming up. So there you go. Yeah, pretty interesting photos. We all like interesting nude photos. What can we say? Gene Snitsky. Man, look at him. Um, Gene Snitsky, uh, has announced his retirement from wrestling. It's not my fault. Um, you won't look at the same, figure eight the same way again? Well, maybe. I'll probably look at it the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Gene Snitsky looks, wow, that is what, yeah, that, that's age. At its finest. Look at him. Oh, boy. Ugh. I think there was a video. Yeah, look at him. There he is. Isn't it amazing? Is it amazing what time does? Here, I want to see if I can find some. Yeah, I really got to see if I can find some old images of him. Yeah, look at this guy. Look at him. Let me see if I can find, like, there we go. Look at that picture of him. But I think this had to have been, like, 2011? Something like that? 2011, 2012? Like, six or seven years ago? Now look at him. Good God. That's insane. Before? After. Before drugs? After drugs. Straight A student. Smoked one joint. <laughs> oh. Man. Yeah, kids. Don't grow up to be Snitsky. Man. Yeah, being off of something. He was off of something. He didn't have the budget. He didn't have the stuff to continue doing the stuff that he was on. And I'm sure it was legal. But holy hell. Um, so Undertaker is being advertised for a six-man tag over the Madison Square Garden event that they're doing on July 7th. But that's not the main reason this page is up here. NXT General Manager William Regal was not at the NXT tapings uh, this week. 
uh, this past week at Full Sail, and the decision was made by WWE to not bring Regal to the tapings, according to Mike Johnson of PW Insider. Regal has not made appearances for the WWE since April due to a personal situation. And I'm just going to leave it at that. We don't know what it is. No need to speculate. No doghouse shit. Okay? Just something going on. We don't know. Who knows? Could be contract disputes. You know? That's what I think it could be. But I'm sure it's something... I'm sure it's something that can be easily talked about and found a solution to. Um, NXT superstars got married Saturday. The Bianca Belair, the chick with the hair, married some guy named Montez Ford, I think, who is also performing with the WWE. Yes, he is. Uh, they were married on Saturday. Oh, that's so sweet. Apparently in a gymnasium of some kind. Don't know where. Ember Moon was there to take some pictures of him. But the real reason this story, this page is up here, is because Stephanie McMahon com campaigned on Saturday all over the Twitter to get people to vote for the uh, prelim balloting for the Emmy nominations that we talked about last week. Because the voting ended last Monday. So she was making her final push over the weekend on the Twitter for everyone who could vote to do so. So, yeah. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm interesting... Yeah, that yeah, Belair, she's the hair whipper. Yeah. Um I'm very, very curious. I really think that they could get one or two nominations. Not all of the four or five that they're asking for. Uh she in particular, she was asking for people to push the mixed match challenge on that was on Facebook and also Raw twenty five, but that's not that's not what's on the prelim balloting. What's on the prelim balloting right now are uh, non, uh, categories of unstructured reality, structured reality, uh, for a live variety program. Um, but the big thing is the structured reality is Monday Night Raw. Not the 25th anniversary, but Monday Night Raw itself, which should absolutely get in. Unstructured reality is the Bellas show and Total Divas. That probably won't get in. Um, for documentary they're nominated for is... Uh, their WWE 24 Empowered is one, but the other one is the Andre the Giant biography run in conjunction with HBO. That might get a nod. Those are the big two I'm looking at possibly getting the nod. Also, WrestleMania 34 for best live variety, for best variety program. I think it's for best primetime for uh, late night variety program. Special. For variety special. I take that back. Not program, but special. That one should get nominated, but I don't see Divas or Bellas getting a shot at all. Um, it's more the Andre documentary, WrestleMania, and Monday Night Raw. Those will probably get, I really hope, but this is the first time they've ever tried this. And it's hard to imagine because they've been on cable television for well over, and I'm talking WWE in general, not just Raw. They've been on cable television for nearly 28 years, getting close to 30 now. Um, it's amazing to think that they haven't done this. So, there you go. Um, this page is not up because of JR saying that Big Cass uh, should try hard. What a story. It's about NXT star um, Oni Lorcan being injured um, during TakeOver uh, Chicago a couple weeks ago. Um, he was injured in his match, uh, suffered a broken orbital bone during the match. This is not as massive an injury as what Brian Kendrick took a while back where he not only had um, he had a broken orbital, orbital bone but a broken nose, a lot of facial fractures. They kept him out of the game for a very long time. Um, that's not going to be the case with Oni Lorcan. We're looking at him probably being out for only three months at most. Three months, four months, four months at most. So I'm going to be very conservative with his um, comeback. Johnny Attitude um, passed away. John Green, he passed away at the age of 53. Former WCW star, and he was the owner of Micro Championship Wrestling, midget promotion. <laughs> uh, he's most known during his time as WWE uh, in WCW for his memorable squash match against Goldberg. Uh, Green mostly wrestled as enhancement talent for WCW at the time. Uh, he then founded Micro Championship Wrestling, which aired as a weekly series on True TV several years ago, 
and he featured Green's longtime friend, Hulk Hogan, as a co-owner. I'm not reading that guy's tweet because he's trying his damnedest to get his name out there for free. <sighs> Sorry. So, there was a house event the WWE held in Anaheim on Sunday, and something happened. <laughs> Yeah, that happened. This isn't unusual. This happens. Okay? And ring hands get fired for it. People get fired for that. But what's more is because of that, um, because of that, um, and that happened in the middle of the show, that means that we got to work with that. Yeah, thankfully he didn't get hurt. There were no injuries. But the problem is, so we have no top rope for the rest of the show. So what do you do? <laughs> you work with what you're given. I would be just afraid of doing that off that second rope when last one. <laughs> And then what do you do afterwards? You kind of take advantage of it, and you want to celebrate and everything, but you might accidentally get someone in the process. Almost got Roman Reigns in the process with that one. So, yeah. Wacky shit happening with the top rope. <laughs> stuff happens. What can I say? Ah, boy. Weird stuff, weird stuff. And you know what? Some people just want to come back. Brie Bella expressing desire to return for one more run in the WWE. <sighs> There's a difference between... Nikki Bella and Brie Bella when it comes to their performance. Yes, Nikki Bella. Um, yes, there are differences physically between the two of them. We could get into that. Um, I, The only way that I would ever stomach her coming back is if they gave her new music. My God. Ugh. Discussed her potential return to the ring after she did an interview with the TV Insider. Uh, she says, my husband really wants us to get pregnant again. I tell him that in my heart. I just really want to come back to have a main story. Whether it's a month long or two months, six months, I would love that. I think about how much work one kid is. Bringing another in, I can't imagine. My sister and I are really pushing hard. We would both love to, especially since the last couple of years. It was Nikki who was there or I was there. The Bella Twins really haven't had a run since the Divas Revolution. There are great teams like the Iconics. We would love to go against them. Even if I had a one-off, I'd love to wrestle Asuka or Alexa. There are so many girls I would wrestle. Even with the Mixed Match Challenge, I was like, Brian, we should do it if it came back. Wouldn't it be amazing? I'm hoping. I told him to give me until next summer. Let me see if I can do something before then. If the boss doesn't want us back by next summer, we can start trying for babies. Uh, Jamel saying, I don't really have a desire for Bree to come back. Nikki, on the other hand, I want to see her back because she has a little more juice left in her. Well... My thing is, I'm indifferent to any of them coming back. I don't really care. I'm fine with what we've got right now. I don't know what exactly they would... If they came back, yay, they're back. It's another memory act. The thing is, I think it would be too soon for them to come back. I think they need more time away. I think they need a little more time away. And what's more is because of their stupid little TV show, who knows if there would ever really be a comfortable time to where when they did come back, it would be seen as a big deal. They tried to make it a big deal at the Royal Rumble, with them being the final two in the ring, you know, but I wasn't having any of that. I knew that wasn't going to be happening. So, I, I, I guess, for her own sentimental sake and for her own psyche, 
She wants to come back because of what she's seen in the ring, and she really would love to be a part of that. It's kind of what we call the Triple H mentality. When you see something really cool happening, man, you want to be a part of that too. So you're going to try, want to shoehorn your way into having it because you think it would be really, really cool, i.e. Triple H and Brock Lesnar, i.e. Evolution versus Shield. Take your pick. So glad we're away from that. You know, we no longer have Triple H wanting to shoehorn himself into something that looks really, really cool. Okay. Him and Daniel Bryan is another one. Okay. Um, Yeah. So. Yeah, she hasn't been. She hasn't been on screen too too bad. I don't care. Do what you want. I I don't care anymore. I just don't. Oh, hey, look at that. Rey Mysterio is going to be on a video game. But I thought he was in negotiations. But that's not what this is about. Actually, that is what this is about. <laughs> yeah, uh, Rey Mysterio's on the cover. There you go. That's 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 all, that's all I got. Um, no, this is not about Aleister Black appearing next week on uh, appearing tonight on WWE NXT. No, this is about Kevin Owens attending his first Shania Twain concert. He's a humongous Shania Twain fan. Okay, I am not going to judge a man for his musical tastes, okay? He's a family man. He's such a great guy, you can tell, okay? And so for him, this is great. His wife got tickets to the concert. He's ecstatic to go. He made a sign that says, I love you, Shania. Shania got out there and they got on stage. Um, I don't know if I'll necessarily be able to play the whole thing, um... You know, just go to WrestleView.com. We've got it up there. Um, but it's it's re- it's really cool. I mean, he's such a fanboy for this, and it's neat to watch. I mean, come on, we all fawn over if if we went if we were mentioned by Kevin Owens. Kevin Owens walked up to us and pulled us into the ring. We would be acting the same way that he kind of is with Shania Twain, except he's more of an actor and he's better around large groups of people and he knows how to talk on the microphone and he carries himself way better. So I encourage you to check out this video. It's really cool. It's really fun to watch. And it really humanizes (laughs) the people that we love watching on TV that are larger than human, that are bigger than human. So there. Um, But the biggest news that probably came from this week um, comes on the injury front. Yeah, comes more on the injury front. Uh, For example... Sami Zayn has both rotator cuffs torn, right and left shoulder. Um, he was asked about this. Um, the average recovery time for a torn rotator cuff is about four to six months, with Zayn repairing one and then facing another surgery in six or seven weeks. He was hopeful for a return to WrestleMania season of next year. Yeah, this is going to be a tough one. So right now, we knew he was wrestling hurt. We knew he was. Yeah, but that's bad. Okay. Um, I want to read his quote here that he has. Um, Because of the timeline, I'd love to be in the mix for WrestleMania this season. That's the most exciting time of the year for all of us. I think timeline-wise, I should be ready in time for WrestleMania, so fingers crossed. There's never a good time to get hurt or get surgeries, but I do feel like I'm starting to hit my stride find my voice, and find myself as a performer, which is funny because 16 years in, it's like I'm rediscovering the art of it, and in a sense, because I'm doing something I've never really done before. So how I come back, when I come back, that all remains to be seen, but I have a pretty good track record, I'd say, overall, and I plan on carrying that forward when I come back. I want to come back just as good, if not better, than I've ever been. So, yeah. Um... Sami Zayn ain't coming back until WrestleMania. I'm going to put it that way. He, I don't know if he'll be on for WrestleMania. I don't. Who knows? But that's right now the timetable for him is WrestleMania. It's going to be a long, long time. Oh, and um, here's the uh, Shinsuke Nakamura story. 
What's going on guys? Dasha Fuentes here in a beautiful Southern California where Smackdown Live is about to kick off in just a few. Now I have some breaking news for you all. I just spoke to General Manager Paige who has informed me that Shinsuke Nakamura suffered an injury last night and there are a few details that are, are known right at this moment but unfortunately he is not medically cleared to compete for the United States Championship tonight against Jeff Hardy. But I caught up with Jeff Hardy and Jeff Hardy did inform me that who cares about what Jeff Hardy said? Nakamura is said to have been in an incident with a police dog that bit him in the leg and forced him to miss last night's main event, uh, event in Fresno. Um, per multiple wrestling media reports. Um, I don't know. Are, pff, grow these. <laughs> they really do. Yeah, that's a good point, Jamel. They, grow, they do grow these female reporters on trees. But what's great is that they're all different fruits that fall from these trees. They could be brunette, they could be blonde, they can have tan skin, they have white skin. I mean, they're they're really good at this. I mean, it looks like they have they bought themselves like a variety pack of female per, um, interviewers and reporters to have for us, and they're always so well dressed. Can we find them like just wearing a t-shirt and jeans or something? I, I don't know. I don't know who that is. I don't know who it is at all. Are you police dog? Are police dogs racial profiling? No, they just bit him because he smelled like fish. I don't know. I don't know who's with. Everyone's asking. You guys are asking who's with Finn Balor. I didn't know that a woman was with Balor. I'm surprised. I didn't know a woman would be with Balor. Just, I, I didn't know. Finally, let's look over this updated card for Extreme Rules. WWE title, AJ Styles defending against Rusev. Women, Raw women's title, Alexa Bliss defending against Nia Jax. That's going to be a snoozer. SmackDown women's title, Carmella defending against Asuka. Another snoozer. Uh, Raw tag team titles, the deleter of worlds going against the B team. Uh, that might be fun. A SmackDown tag team titles. The Hammer Brothers are defending against Team Hell No. That sounds like a lot of fun. There you go. That's the news for the week. Yep, that's the news for the week. Well, actually, there were more news. There was a little show that happened over in the UK. There's a little special that happened. Um, yeah, this happened, I think, uh, today... It was today or yesterday? Yesterday. It was yesterday was day two of their little UK championship special. Um, I think for everyone's benefit here, um, it's only a day after. I don't know if I want to cover it because I feel like I might be spoiling for some of you. And I'm also going to be honest, I haven't watched it yet. Just because I've been working. I haven't checked it out yet. And I really don't want to look at the results. I've read them, but I don't want to read too in deep to them. But all that I do know was that there was the announcement of NXT UK, which sounds like a great idea on paper, but could fail miserably. But I see it, I see it succeeding more than failing. Because the WWE right now wants to take advantage of new TV rights deals with Sky Sports. I believe that's who they're with. Ashley might be able to confirm it with me because he's over there in that area. Um, they have new television rights deals with um, Sky over there um, across the pond. And this would be a program that they would have on there just for Sky. And of course they'd have it on the WWE Network. Uh, but still... Uh, Ashley says it's a shame the shows were taped the week before the show live would have been incredible, but I understand the fan fatigue directly after take over Chicago. Yeah. And that's fine. But my thing is, is that I would much rather prefer them doing a live show than anything else. There's just, I love live television. I would much rather have it live than taped because then you run into spoilers being put out there. I love live television, but still. We have the announcement of NXT UK. We'll see how this turns out. This is going to be a very, very interesting time.
for the WWE and branching out into having their own territories. What could be next? India, Middle East, Australia, having their own in Japan. Watch your ass. Watch your ass. You're going to Japan. China. China will definitely happen. China will absolutely happen. We're going to do a quick look over of the injuries so far. We still have Dean Ambrose that's out with a tendons in uh, triceps injury. He should be back around September was when he was slated. But everyone is saying that he's back in the performance center, that he's still he is good to go now. Uh, Jason Jordan had neck surgery. Don't know when he's going to be back. They said he was going to be back on Memorial Day. We're now a month away from that. We don't know when he's coming back. Neville, contract dispute. He's still on the roster page. Don't know what's going on with him. Epico Cologne, shoulder surgery cleanup. We have no idea what's going on with him. We haven't even seen his brother on television. Milk carton coming up soon after this. Uh, let's see. Uh, Samir Singh, torn ACL. He'll be back for Survivor Series. Tamina, torn rotator cuff. She's going to be back in time for SummerSlam. Bobby Fish, torn ACL and MCL. He'll be back after SummerSlam. We'll see. That's going to be a long one to recover from. Randy Orton, torn meniscus September of this year. We'll see. They might milk that a little bit further. We'll see what they have in store for him. Sami Zayn, two rotator cuffs. Not until next year's WrestleMania. And finally, Oni Lorcan. Broken orbital bone. I'm slating him for October, but it could absolutely be sooner than October. I'm just being very conservative with this right now. Jamal, kind of on a similar note, dude, Doug, do you think the WWE would benefit from shaving the pay-per-views down to about eight a year with the big five and about three others? I don't know. Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. Sky does have a deal with the WWE, but given that world of sport, which WWE sees as its main opposition, is available in every single home, WWE may be trying to do a deal with another TV company that is available to all. Gotcha. Gotcha, Ashley. No, I totally understand. Yeah, world of sport could be seen as their major competition. I don't know if WWE necessarily sees world of sport as viable competition. They're television competition, but in, as far as what they do and the audience that they're trying to grab maybe not who knows okay but right now it just seems that the wwe is trying to come up with a product to sell for rights in england is what it is right now because they have the territories in england right now they have the negotiations and contract going on right now i believe with progress up there so we'll see how it goes neville it could be possible that he joins nxt uk absolutely but as far as jamel's question about wwe pay-per-views and toning it down yes and no they'll always have the big four okay they'll always have the big four being royal rumble wrestlemania SummerSlam, survivor series um the problem right now is there's so much change happening with the wwe at its core that changing the pay-per-view structure is minute right now. And this leads me right into the TV rights deals that have come up. This morning, WWE stock opened at $73, near $73. It was their highest start ever as a company. Nearly Six months ago, they opened at half that amount. This is what it what their stock looked like today. I haven't even looked at this chart yet. Probably because, aw, snap, it's not there. But we'll reload it. So here we are at one day. We opened around 9.30. It opened at $74. You kind of see how throughout the day it just went up and down, up and down, but still stayed around the $70 mark. We opened the day at 7, uh, looks like we opened at 74, but we closed at 70, about 71. Closed at $70.85. Okay. WWE stock is selling for over $70 six months ago. Look at that. $70 is 
Six months ago, WWE stock was selling at $30. Six months ago. One year ago. Selling at 20. Five years ago. He had a small uptick. TV rights deal. But even that TV rights deal didn't spike him above 30. They opened that day after the TV rights deal. There it was. They opened at $31. But look at that. Five years ago. And all. This is throughout the company's history. Stock opened when they for initially became public. Opened to $24. Throughout this time, you could have bought stock with the WWE as low as $9 a share. Back in 03. Nine dollars not just too expensive for you. You could have bought it at seven dollars and fifty cents. Look at that. And that was back in 2012. In six years time, their stock price has gone up tenfold due to these TV rights deals. And how did they get these TV rights deals? I mean, Fox has, already, has now confirmed um, that SmackDown Live will be moving. They will be going to Friday nights starting October 4th of next year. WWE issued a press release yesterday confirming that USA and NBC Universal extended rights to Monday Night Raw for five years, making triple what they were initially making on their contract. That involves all of their programming. Understand that. Not all the shows that are on USA. Just one show gets to be on there and they're making three times as much as what they were. Only one show is going to a new home and they're making $1 billion from it in the span of what is it? Is it three years or is it five years? Five years, in span of five years. For the next five years, these are their homes. SmackDown is on Fox, Raw is on USA. Understand, on a side note, yeah, Disney is not the Fox Networks, actually. Yeah. Right. Um, this is why the stock is going up. But why did the TV rights deals happen? How did they make so much money hand over fist? How did this happen? This was a collective effort that goes all the way back, yes, to the startup of the WWE Network. The WWE the Network has a big part to do with this. Don't get me wrong. It's their entity. It's their baby. It's their encyclopedia. Was Ronda a factor? A little bit. But I, you cannot place all of your eggs on one person. No. This was through the collective effort they've been doing for the past three years. Actually, ever since Stephanie McMahon became head of advertising, marketing, online presence. That's what she's been doing. Media is what Stephanie McMahon has been doing. That has been her title. She is their media official. Ever since she went into that role four years ago, five years ago, I believe, USA Today, ESPN, Sports Illustrated, Forbes Magazine, the magazine, the publication itself, Rolling Stone, Time Magazine, she has reached out to every major media entity out there that would consider putting anything related to the WWE in their publication, on their programming. And how would they do that? Through joint collaboration, ESPN doing some films for them, using WWE's production capability. WWE Productions is a separate outfit. Helping them in some way. Scratching backs. 
you know, when it comes to ESPN. They offer money to others to USA Today and Sports Illustrated. I mean, they, they aren't actively reporting on the WWE. WWE had to do some pay for this. They had to invest in these media outlets to get the coverage that they were getting. Because they sure as hell weren't getting it five, six years ago. They've done a lot of fundraising, a lot of charity work. Not this stupid be a star campaign. Not that. We're talking going out there and reaching out to the Susan Komen Foundation. Reach out to Special Olympics. They've been doing stuff with Special Olympics for Lord knows how long. Make a wish. Right now, this is the highest the WWE has ever been. They are on a all-time high right now. Making money hand over fist. Getting their name out there. Brand recognition. Everything. And this is what happens. You end up having jokers like me that are kicking themselves that they could have bought a share in this company for $7.50 less than six years ago. I'm sorry, but yeah, less than six years ago, and you could have been making a profit of tenfold. To everyone out there who's saying WWE does not know wrestling, you don't know how to make money. Say that this is not actual professional wrestling. It doesn't matter. It's entertainment. To those of you who are saying that Stephanie McMahon, Triple H, and Vince McMahon, they don't know how to run a co- Really? They really don't know? Well, I'll be damned. What the hell do we know? This is more about Stephanie than anything else. This is not about certain talents. This isn't about certain talents. It's not about their show in general. It's about being promoted. It's about getting your name out there. It's about marketing. That's what this is all about. It's not about what they're specifically doing on the show. It Well, it is kind of about what they are physically doing on the show. If they were doing what they were doing in the Attitude Era right now, this shit would not be happening. No way in hell. Those of you complaining about WWE PG, shut your face. That's what I got to say about all of this. I may sound angry just because I'm fucking jealous. Just because I wish I could have bought at least maybe five shares. If I had bought five shares... Man, that's easily an extra 500 bucks that I would have had right there just doing nothing. You know. They have basically priced themselves out of any having any competition. It's them. It is all them. There is no such thing as competing with the WWE. There's no such thing. Attitude stuff would never have gotten this on network TV. Well, they kind of did. SmackDown was on network TV, albeit a very offshoot UHF channel, but it was on network TV. Uh, Future of marketing. Yep, philanthropy is the future of marketing. That's the way it's going to win. Yep, yep, yep. So that's that. I'm going to try to quickly fly through this little final segment here before we get on to a very interesting match that I've been wanting to check out. But before I do that, take a quick sip. Time for the WWE Milk Carton. What the WWE Milk Carton is, is I'm going to be showing you some performers that have not been on mainstream WWE television within three in the past three weeks. We've seen some people get off the milk carton and actually come back to WWE TV. Authors of Pain is being one. They hadn't been on TV for nearly a month and a half, almost two months. Ty Dillinger was one. He hadn't been on TV for three weeks until his little critique of James Elmsworth wearing Asuka's mask. So, who is on the milk carton this week? Preferred poison of choice whiskey, tequila, or vodka? It doesn't matter to me. Right now, I just downed some uh, 
Captain Morgan Silver Spice Rum and Coke. I will try to make the same thing for our match of the night. But who's on the milk carton? I thought this Joker was supposed to be going against uh, Andrade Cien Almas. What happened? What in the world happened? Sin Cara has not been on TV in the past three weeks. His last time he was on TV was for said segment with Sin Cara back on June 5th. Haven't seen him since. The Ascension. Nope, not another fight backstage. No, nothing. The Ascension. We haven't seen them since the tag team battle royal to determine who would be the number one contenders for the tag team titles on Raw. That was back on June 5th. I mean, June 4th. Haven't seen them. We've seen Brizongo and the Fashion Police on TV more than we've seen these guys, and that's sad. I really love their music. I love their look and everything, but... We've already got two other monster teams that are on the roster. They aren't really considered a monster team. They're more like a comedic monster team. But this is looking really rough. It's looking really, really rough for the Ascension right now. What about the bar? Well, the bar, they've been doing a lot of promo stuff in Europe. They're too busy watching the World Cup. They they did a uh, marketing thing for Universal Studios where they went to Universal Studios with the lucky winners of some kind. They've been doing a lot of promo and marketing work. That's why they haven't been on TV. But they really have not been mentioned that much. They haven't been shown on television. Live on television. At the arena. So, right now they might be nursing some injuries while at the same time doing some marketing stuff. Who knows? Who knows what it could be, but the last time we did see them was back on May the 29th. They were in the six-man tag where they tagged with The Miz against the New Day. Goldust. Haven't seen him since May the 7th, where he went into Kurt Angle's office begging to be put into the Money in the Bank uh, ladder match. And you know what? We're just not going to put you in that match, and in fact, we're just not going to have you do a damn thing. <laughs> How about that? Instead, we're going to have you come to WWE Studios. We're going to have you do the photo shoot show that we have, which is not a bad show. We'll have you do the photo shoot show, and why don't you just go have fun with your big dogs at home? Yeah, why don't you just do that? Oh, hey, there's Primo Cologne. Uh, he's just waiting for Epico to be have healthy so that they can both do nothing at the same time. Didn't see – last time we saw him was the Greatest Royal Rumble. Hmm? Well, yeah, there is the Chris Jericho. We haven't seen him since the Greatest Royal Rumble. There is another guy that we haven't seen here, and I've got to add him on here real quick. If you don't, uh, just pardon me, this won't take long. I accidentally had a file name change here. I'll bring him up here real quick. There we go. So, yeah, we know, we know about all of those people. How about the Mike Kanellis? Haven't seen him since Greatest Royal Rumble. Yeah, Chris Jericho, I mentioned him before. Uh, ah, Bork. Bork, Bork, Bork. Such a work. You don't have to do shit and people still have feelings for you. What about you? If you saw on the Twitter, I kind of called out our truth Asking, you know, if you had found him. Yeah, he, yeah, R Truth retweeted his own milk carton, which I thought, he gets it. He gets it, you know, and he's, he's such a, he's, I've met him in person at least two or three times. He lives here in Charlotte, okay? You can't miss him, okay? He's just such a fun guy. He's such a great, fun, God fearing guy, you know? I really, really hope sometime I would love to sit down and really have an interview with him about him coming through um, choosing professional wrestling as a career, all of the great creative stuff that he does outside, what he does for the community here in Charlotte as well. I mean, he's just a great guy. I think there's so much about him that is not talked about um, by anyone 
with regards to wrestling. He has been involved in some of the most awkward entrances in all of professional wrestling. However, he's been in some of the most the, the some of the funniest segments. And it's great for yeah, you're right, Jamel. It's great for Archer to never ta- not taking himself too seriously. He sure as hell does it. He's loving life right now because he's not on TV and traveling. <laughs> He hasn't traveled or been on TV, I don't think, since April 14th is what it is. 17th. He hasn't been on TV since the Superstar Shake-Up. Okay. He's just loving life right now. He's collecting a paycheck and grabbing some Chick-fil-A over in Charlotte. Okay. So, we'll see if he ever appears on TV again. We'll see. We'll see. But, that's the WWE milk carton. If you see any of these people... Please contact their family and friends. Let them know that they're okay. Um, For God's sakes, maybe lure them with a chew toy or something. Let them know that they are loved and we miss them. Or we at least want to know that they still have a job. Yeah, so that's that. We've gotten all the good, interesting, serious stuff out of the way. Now it is time for the fun stuff probably the reason that you guys are here where me i am really really curious about this bringing it up on my side i'm of course talking about the match of the night it's going to be from kana promania this is kana or asuka's retirement show this was her final match in japan february 25th 2014 up against mako satamura who will be performing in the May Young Classic coming up later this year, the second one, the second classic that they're doing. Before I bring this up, um, I need to fill this up. You might need to fill up some more for yourself. Maybe, maybe. Let me bring up the match here. There we go. Bring this up. I might have to reload it. Yeah, let me refresh it here just in case. Whoops do that there we go there we go bring that up get it all queued up but in the meantime i need to fill this glass up you go fill your glass up if you're not going to do that in the meantime enjoy this graphic of scott steiner hating ducks and i'll be right back Making noises, making noises so that you know that I'm here. I'm here. You know, sometimes you just have to be simple, so screwdriver. There you go. Put a lot of vodka in this one, too. Deanna, Deanna my girlfriend, bought some organic vodka. She's on, she eats organic food non-gmo stuff and it's been wonders for me it's great stuff you know great it it's expensive as hell but i don't know how in the hell you can tell the difference between organic vodka and regular vodka it just tastes like vodka to me i don't know she's the one who went to the liquor store i didn't so and she's already downed a lot of the rum. so it's my turn okay here we are asuka versus meiko satomura Kana Promania, Kana's retirement show from Japan, February 25th, 2014. The thing about this show, 
is this is not your typical wrestling match. There's going to be some mood lighting, like um, like Sin Cara's first matches. There's also going to be some music being played in the background with a uh, shamisen, or Japanese. God, I love the sound of a shamisen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're going to love this. Okay, But... I'm very curious about this match. It's going to be a very peculiar one. Um, I I got some replies on Twitter about it saying, "Oh, you're I really want to see what you think about this one." So, let's see what I think about this one. Asuka versus Mako Satomura. Weird match from Kana's retirement show in 2014, and here we go. Hmm. sound? Well, this is Mako. Yeah, as long as it's not Osprey Ricochet, I'm sure I'll be fine with this one. Don't have any sound. I think that's just part of the video. We'll see if it comes back up. I think it's just part of the video. That's all. I think it's because they were playing licensed music. They had to mute that. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> to make sure I've got the sound right so you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, Andrew. You want to see um check out something cool on YouTube. Look up I think it's the Yoshida brothers. They do some it's really cool shamisen work mixed in with um beats, like techno beats and stuff. some samurai shampoo after this. Don't know why. Way too Japanese for it to be in America, okay? Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Contacts. 
face paint. Wow. Masquerade mask. Wow. Actual tights and not tinted pants. That's a pretty cool entrance. And apparently this was Asuka's greatest rival in Japan. They had many matches together, tag matches, for and against. Yeah, this was her rival. see on a TV show or an anime or a movie where there's a soundtrack going on, you know. This is a fabulous idea. Don't get me wrong, this is not the first time we've seen something like this. Something like this happened with um, WCW and Monday Nitro. Uh, tried, uh, WCW tried promoting themselves on MTV during MTV Spring Break, and they did a sideshow on there during their spring break program where in the background they had the heavy metal band Fear Factor playing in the background. It was horribly done. Horrible. No pacing, no nothing. This is completely different. how the pacing of the match changes. That's what I'm interested in seeing. Down now. 
the tone is different. how it is right now. Does it make it look like they're fighting under moonlight? Okay, giving it more dramatic feel. If they had some cherry blossoms in the breeze, there we go. The only way this would ever happen in the WWE is Asuka were wrestling in Japan for a WWE special. This would never, ever happen anywhere, any other time. Male referee, too. Music. Asuka loves the screaming. Thank <laughs> you. 
just seems like just a flawless match to me. The mood lighting and the soundtrack in the background. This is seriously like if you were watching a Japanese a Japanese movie and there is a moonlight sword fight going on. This is great. Uh, this is just, this is great. I had no video package to educate me on why this is happening. Ooh. All that I know is that this is Asuka's retirement match. And that's all you really need to know. Gotta be it right there. Do it in. Strikes look a little sloppy from Asuka. Mm, God. Come on now. Now, come on now. That was dumb. No, 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 no. I'm not digging that. I'm not digging that. I'm not digging that at all. in the slow three count.
music. Yeah, yeah, she just has the uh, kick pads on. I am not digging these slow threes. Very WWE structure. The match is very, very WWE structure. Good finish. Not a tap out, put to sleep. Good. interesting very 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 interesting stuff it was a very very structured a very very wwe structured like match where you had someone going to the well too much and it come back to haunt them um the only thing i just give it that is the that referee's slow count i'm not a fan of i i don't know love oscar wrote for yep um that was a very interesting match. That was very, very cool. Um, I did like how you would notice there was change in the soundtrack that was going on as there would be a, a submission going on or as someone regained their footing. Then the tempo would slow down. Uh, the tone would change from high pitch to low pitch as we got through tension-filled sequences. Um, that was a very, very cool match. Um, yeah. Don't know how else to really put it. Um, would we ever see something like that here in the States? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Would it be cool to see again? Sure, in Japan. Something like that. But only Asuka or Mako could do something like that. No one else can do anything like that. You would never see something like that in the States with an American or any other international wrestler. No, it just wouldn't happen. But no, that was pretty cool. Kind of glad I kind of did some investigating to stumble upon something like that. Um, I got no problem watching other female matches. It's just, I hope it's just not for the sake of, you know, lusting over a body or just seeing women beating the shit out of each other just because they, because the men do it, you know? It's got to have a story behind it. It's got to have a reason behind it. That's what that was. That's what that match was. There's a reason behind it. Kana's number one rival, her final match, when they have one final showdown. There you go. That's a reason to have it. That's going to do it for WrestleView Weekly. Before I go, remember, you can check us out over at Podcast Row, over at StarCast, Labor Day weekend for the All In event over in Chicago. Adam and I are going to be over there at Podcast Row talking to some people, handing out some Cheetos. I might be throwing Cheetos at, Cheetos at people. I'll probably make a buffoon out of myself. That's what I'm really good at. So, going to be doing that. Also, you can catch me on the Twitter, at Doug WrestleView. That's where you can also send me your suggestions for match of the night. Send me some stuff. I'm, I'm kind of running dry in the well here. I can't rely on Dark Overlord Meltzer all the time. Mm, let's see. Uh, also, 
tell your friends to follow me. I got to watch Wrestle Kingdom 12. Okay, I got to do this. I got to get up to 100. We got to. I want to get this show pumping and on the road. Yeah. And I can't do that just by accusing our truth of not working and hanging out at Chick fil A all day. <laughs> I can only do so much. I'm trying to do more. But till then, I will see you guys next week. We're going to be having to, we got to make some predictions soon. I got plenty of tequila that I'm going to drink if I get my predictions wrong. But until then, I'll see you guys then. See you next week. I know I got plenty of matches from you, Ashley. I know. I got to sort through them. Maybe send them to me again. Who knows? I don't know. I'll find something. I'll find something. You'll know about it on the Twitter. Let me try this again. Until then, I'll see you guys next. I'll see you guys next week. Okay. <laughs>